Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Saroya Mall. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Communication Arts at the University of Waterloo. And I just want to extend the warmest wishes to all of you because this is our first event in over two years for the Indigenous Speaker Series. So I just want to do a round of applause just for everyone being here. It just, it's so great. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank Kathy Munro and Timothy Kedlick for providing ASL interpretation for us. So thank you so much for being here. So I've been involved with the Indigenous Speaker Series now. It's been about seven years, and it's a tremendous honor for me to serve on this committee. And the series itself, it's made up of a collaboration of the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center, as well as the Faculty of Arts, as well as um, organizers from the offices of Indigenous Relations and Research, uh, as well as departments in history and communication, uh, communication arts. So a lot of people um, take part in putting these events together. So as we move away from virtual spaces and come here and, and find spaces to gather together, each of us, we're coming in from different locations. So, for example, I'm coming in from Treaty 13, which is Toronto or to Toronto, which is Mohawk, which means uh, where the trees are standing in water. But it's also it's also the territory of the Mississauga of the Credits, the Chippewa, the Wendat, and many diverse First Nations, Métis people and Inuit. So for me, getting on the bus this morning, go bus, I cross Seneca territory, and then I arrive here on the traditional territory of the Attawateron, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And the main campus itself, we're located on the Haldeman Track. And uh, this is land that's been promised to Six Nations, and it's, it encompasses six miles on either side of the grant. And I really encourage people to go to that location and really consider what's promised as well in your location, in your connection to that space as well. So I'm a guest. I'm a guest here, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be here. And coming from Toronto, I'm also part of something called the Dish with One Spoon. And this is a covenant that was made among Indigenous nations, but it also involves newcomers as well. And it's a promise, it's a bond that states that we're going to take care of each other. We're going to take care of the environment. We're going to take care of all beings. And this covenant is something that embodies everything that I do here on this territory, but wherever I go. So I encourage you when you leave here today, really reflect on the territory, the historical contexts, the present contexts and future and your connections to those. And when you travel, do the same as well. So as we move forward, uh, Robin Stadelbauer, uh, from a, uh, she is the Indigenous Relations Coordinator at the Office of Indigenous Relations and Research, and she will be introducing our guest speaker today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Well, for such a warm uh, opening and uh, informative. It's great to know um, the history of the lands that we're on and and thank you for sharing your, you know, your journey as you come to Waterloo and in the territories that you pass. So thank you all for being here today and for joining us virtually and in person. I am going to introduce our guest today. But before I do that, I am going to introduce myself. So Robin Dijnikaz, Robin is my name. Ngeg Dodem, I am Otter Clan. Now Shingaming Nadom Jawa, I am from Kate Croker, also known as the Chippewas of Miwash Unceded First Nation, and Neoshigaming. 
I'm also the Indigenous Relations Coordinator here at the University of Waterloo, working in the Office of Indigenous Relations. And I am honored to introduce our very special guest today and the speaker, Lenore Kijek. Lenore is also a citizen of the Chippewas of Niwash Unceded First Nation. She is a traditional storyteller, a poet, and an author. She resides at Neoshigadin on the Saugeen Peninsula within the territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Lenore works as a naturalist providing education programs about the natural and cultural history of the Saugeen Peninsula, but also of the Great Lakes. Lenore is a published and award-winning author. Lenore has a long history in the literary world and has been a trailblazer and an advocate for Indigenous writers. As a citizen of Neoshigaming myself, I can personally speak to the role model uh, that Lenore has been um, to me personally, as well as her husband, David. I first heard Lenore speak when I was a young teenager at a very large event. I was nervous being there. Um, it was a very large event. Um, and I was just so moved by what Lenore has, had said and just the way that she delivered it and the messages that she was giving. It was, it, it stuck with me. Um, it was a very interesting opening. <laughs> it was a, uh, grabbed everybody's attention. And around that same time in our territory, there was a, a fishing dispute going on. And David and Lenore, and along with a few others, had the insight to gather the youth in the community together to um, educate us on what was going on um, in the territory. They, they educated us on the issue, but also uh, the history of our territory, including the treaties, just in case we encountered any uh, anybody outside as we were going to school because we people who live on a reserve go to school uh, high school off reserve and i can tell you that that information came in handy because we did encounter as as secondary students we did encounter some some comments and backlash and we were able to to speak to them with from a calm educated educational place so miigwech for that lenore for being a role model uh, for me personally all the way through so, and miigwech for being here today. We're so thrilled for that you're here with us, sharing some knowledge and sharing some stories with us today. Your time and your work and what you do and what you have to say is, is valued. Um, so on behalf of the University Water, of Waterloo, a very warm welcome to you and over to you. I have greeted you in my language, Anishinaabe Moen. I've told you my name, Lenore. I've told you my clan, Mayangan, the wolf. Indodam is my clan. I told you where I come from. I actually told you where my sound comes from. Nia Shingaming, Indonjiba. Nia Shingaming, aka Cape Croker, also known as the Chippewas of Nawash, unceded First Nation. Indonjiba means, well, some people say it means I come from, but it actually means my sound comes from. And what is my sound? My sound is my voice, my breath, my background, whatever it is that makes me comes from that place. I'd like to say a big thank you to, uh, to Robin and to the students here for inviting me uh, to be your special guest today. Um, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I was still growing up in the 70s. I wanted to be a storyteller. I wanted to be a writer. And I really didn't know how to do any of these things uh, except uh, by entertaining my, 
my brothers and by listening to my parents. So I dedicate this presentation to my parents who are now in the spirit land. I give them thanks for teaching us about storytelling and for teaching us about the, um, the written word. Now, one of the big things we used to do in my family is read, read out loud and tell stories. Now, it was usually my father who told the stories. And of course, his favorite stories were the stories of Nana Bush. Nana Bush is our trickster teacher. And those stories were pretty awesome, you know? And when my dad would tell those stories, you know, tears would weld up in his eyes. My mother, on the other hand, she was more of a, a, a book learning person. And, uh, but they both read to us. There was this one time, um, it was Reader's Digest Condensed. Anybody remember that? Or is that before your time? <laughs> okay, it was a story about the lion and a movie was made uh, of that uh, story uh, some years later. And this is, this is how the story unfolded. My dad sat in the big armchair. My mother sat at the head of the couch. And then all, the, all my younger siblings sat on the couch. And us bigger kids, we sat on the floor. And we listened. And they'd read. And they'd pass the book back and forth. So every night, we got uh, sections of this story. But I remember this one night. My mother was reading, and it was about, about the lion and, and how the, the, the story was unfolding, was that there was discussion about whether this lion needed to be held captive or set free. And my mother started to cry. She passed the book over to my dad. He started reading. And then he started to cry. And then he passed the book back to my mom. And she read until she cried. And so the book went back and forth and back and forth between their tears and their and the beautiful words of the story. And we're all sitting on the floor, wiping our eyes and sniffling. So my mother and my father. Now, some of the stories I have here before I get into reading, reading poetry. Uh, some of these stories um, were actually actually happened within within maybe even weeks of, of, of their telling. But it wasn't until we kids, me and my sibs, had our kids that these stories actually had a had a title to them. So this is called the kiss. Now my dad didn't always work at home. Growing up in the 50s and, and the 60s, uh, it, was, it was a tough time on the, on the reserve. And my dad had to leave home, sometimes for long periods, and then uh, and come home on weekends. He'd go off to the big city in Toronto, or Detroit, or Buffalo, or um, other places. Hamilton, and he'd wash windows or he'd do any kind of high, high deal work. And then he'd come home. And, um, but this particular story, he was working in our community. Actually, I think he was working in Owen Sound at RCA Victor. So, how it worked out was that every morning, my mother would get up, she'd be the first one up, she'd get up and she'd make the fire in the, in the wood cook stove. And then my dad would get dressed and wash up and he'd come down. And the two of them would sit at the kitchen table and my mother would prepare breakfast for him. She also made his lunch. Well, that was their time together. 
And then this one day, my dad was feeling what amorous. So, you know, the he had his breakfast. They walked out to the car together. And my dad was in the car, put it, turned on the ignition and getting ready to uh, shift the gears and drive. Then he thought to himself, he said, I wonder what my wife would do if I threw her a kiss. So he went, he threw her a kiss. And then he said, I don't know what happened to that woman. She spun around. She went into the house, and I could see that she was running back and forth and back and forth, looking out the window and shaking her head. And then she was upstairs looking out the window, shaking her head. And I wondered what the heck I had done. Then she came outside, and there she was. I rolled down the window, and she leaned over, and she said, They're in your pocket, Dawn. Yeah, I don't know, not many people smoke these days, <laughs> but uh, my mom was a smoker, my dad smoked a little bit, and uh, <laughs> so the smoke, he was, she was trying to give her a kiss, and she thought, it, he, she thought he wanted a smoke. Now, my dad went to school on the res. He... Um, he went to school, he was punished for speaking wrong language. He was punished for speaking Anishinaabe Mawin, our language. He was punished for speaking French because he was bilingual when he went to school. His grandmother, his grandmother was French Métis. And then he was punished for giving the wrong answer in English. And at that time, he only knew two words, yes and no. Anyhow, my father stayed in school then just long, long enough to learn how to read and write and do arithmetic. So he was about 17, 15, 16, 17, ready to go out and make his way in the big world. And he ended up in a, in a, in a logging camp somewhere in northern Ontario. And he said, he said the work was hard. Food was good, and they all had a warm bed to sleep in. And of course, they were paid once a month. So with his first pay, like everybody else, he went into town and drank it away. Nothing to show for it. Well, he thought about that for a while and then realized that, you know, he's got to do something a little bit better than drink his money away. So next time, a month later, got their pay and he went into town and um, he do things a little differently. He went and, uh, to the hotel and actually went and got a room and a, had a warm bath. And then he went to the library. He said he was looking for books about Indian people. He wanted to read, uh, you know, the uh, uh, learn about other Indian people in North America. Of course, he didn't find many books. What he did find all predicted that the Indian would vanish from the face of the earth within in 50, 70 years. And that really bothered him. You know, would he ever grow to be an old man? And what about all his family? What would happen to them? They vanish too. So he said he thought about it because it really bothered him. He thought about it day after day, week after week. And then he came up with a solution. Something as a young Anishinaabe Nine he would do. He decided when he could, when when he was when he was ready, that he would find a nice, young, beautiful woman. And he'd fuck like crazy. So, here I am. I am a political statement. I am the oldest of ten. I have children of my own, plus 
grandchildren and a great granddaughter. To say nothing of the great great grandchildren that um, are progeny of my my mother and my father. One thing I like to think of, you know, um, with with my dad. He did not go to residential school. He was hidden from the authorities. Um, he was actually told to go and hide in the bush by his grandmother, and uh, she um, took care of him. All his other siblings, all of them, went to residential school throughout the years. And the stories, oh, when I was a kid, the stories that they would tell my dad's brothers about uh, what went on at Spanish. A lot of these are written in Basil Johnson's Indian School Days. And one thing that one thing that I remember is how these these kids in residential schools how they how they rebelled, how they kept the language alive. And they were determined to do it in spite of the in spite of the the beatings. They would run, they would hide, they would they would talk on the shabby and they'd keep the language alive. So in a way they were kind of like, yeah, you know, kids in rebellion. And speaking of rebellion, I remember one rebellion we had at uh, St. Mary's Indian Day School. It came about on a beautiful autumn day. You know, just one of those, one of those really warm, bright, colorful days where you just want to run and run and yell and run. Well, that was that day. And it was warm. I know for a while, as uh, girls, we sat on the grass and we splayed out our skirts sit there and look pretty. And the yelling, wherever it was all around the school, kids were yelling, big kids, little kids, and we finally, as pretty girls, we got up and we joined the yelling. It was a great time. It was just wonderful to be alive. And then Sister Mary Frances came out. She stood on the back porch and she yelled at us. She said, stop it, stop it. You're all acting like a bunch of wild Indians. And we stopped momentarily. The older kids started. Did she call us wild Indians? Did she call us wild Indians? We'll show her. We'll show her some wild Indians. The big boys went over to one of the nuns' pet projects. That was their pigeon coop. And in the pigeon coop, they had these fan tailed pigeons, these great white breasted pigeons, these beautiful fan tails. Well, they reached into the coop and they pulled out. I'm sure they didn't pull them off the birds because there were lots of feathers lying around the coop. So they picked out these feathers and then they handed them out to all of us and we took them and we put them in our black hair. And then we went around the schoolyard looking for sticks and we got sticks maybe about a, a foot long. And then we took these sticks and we plunged them into the hearts of fallen apples. And we held those apples, those sticks, those apples above our heads, and we ran around and around that school. Yeah, 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 yeah! Woo, 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 woo. And we didn't stop till the bell rang and lunch recess was over. And our teacher. At none, she never called us wild Indians again.
I have a daughter. I have actually four daughters, but I'm talking about my youngest daughter right now. Her name is Emma, and Emma owns nine horses. She's teaching me how to ride horses. That was my, uh, when I turned 65, I decided I would do something completely different. I'd get over my fear of horses and I would do some leg exercise, riding horses. Anyhow, when Emma was really, Emma was a babe. She didn't, she didn't talk, she used sign language. She had a, she wanted to eat some cough drops. So she brought me the box, she shook it like this and she went, <laughs> she wanted some cough drops. So I gave her some cough drops. One day I took Emma to the doctor's office. This was time for her first immunization. And um, she didn't like it. He jabbed her with the needle and she screamed. She screamed as loud as she could and she cried and then she stopped and she just went stiff. That was okay for a while until I tried to put her into the car seat. And you know, it just happened to be freezing rain that day and the wind was blowing and my baby, I could, she wouldn't bend. I, I, I couldn't put her into the car seat. And I'm standing there and the rain is pelting down and the trees are blowing and I thought, what am I gonna do now? And then I thought, oh, look, Emma, look, the trees, they're waving at you. And she blinked her eyes and she looked and when she happened, that's when I was able to strap her into the car seat. It broke her concentration. So this is a story that in, was inspired by, by Emma. It's called Emma and the Trees. I just have to remember how it starts. Emma and the Trees. Trees everywhere know Emma. They know Emma when she's in the car. They know Emma when she's in the bus. They know when Emma's on the train. They even know when Emma's at Nana's place. Trees everywhere know Emma. It all started one day when Emma did not want to put her snowsuit on. Mother said, come on, Emma, arm in here. But no, Emma, no, she didn't want to put her snowsuit on. Finally, mother was able to put snowsuit on Emma and took her outside. And Emma cried and cried and cried and cried. And mother looked up the street and Emma cried. Mother looked down the street and Emma cried. And finally, mother looked up into the trees and Emma cried. After a while, mother said, look, Emma, look, the trees, they're waving at you. They're saying, don't cry, Emma, don't cry. Emma looked up and the trees were waving. And then all the way to the grocery store, the trees waved at Emma. And all the way home from the grocery store, the trees waved at Emma. Trees everywhere waved at Emma. And Emma waves to the trees now. And she says, hi trees, hello trees, how are you? Isn't it a beautiful day? I would like to uh, share poetry. And I believe that my love of poetry uh, came from my mother. My mother, when we were when we were young, and my father was away working, and my mother would read to us. Um, we read about the Raven, and consequently, my name comes from Edgar Allan Poe's *The Raven*. Poe's *The Raven*, evermore. And 
we heard I guess some of the some of the the classics like the Lady of Shalott, the the Highwayman, and of course E. Pauline Johnson. And um, and I guess it's that way that, that I fell in love with uh, with poetry, uh, with 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 um, with writing. So I'd like to share. I'd like to share my poetry with you. Now, I just want to say a bit about these things. Some of these are dreams. I'm not going to say which one. But some of these are dreams and when I started to write, I thought I would write these because they were so vivid, such so vivid. And I thought, OK, so I'm going to write them. I'm going to paint a picture with words. I'm not going to try to say what these stories mean or what these dreams. I'm just going to I'm just going to paint pictures with words. I grew up. I grew up on the reserve thinking it was the most beautiful place in the world. I grew up thinking I'm never going to leave this place. I was a child, a child who would lie under trees, watch winds rhythm sway leafy boughs back and forth, back and forth sweeping the clouds into great piles and rocking me as I snuggled in the grass like a bug basking in the sun. I grew up on the reserve thinking it was the most beautiful place in the world. I was a child, a child who ran wild rhythms through the fields, the streams, the bush, eating berries, cupping cool water to my wild stained mouth and hiding in the treetops with my friends. We used to laugh at teachers and tourists who called our bush forest or woods. Forest and woods were all places in fairy tale text. Places where people, especially children, got lost, where wild beasts roam. Our bush was where we played, where the rabbits, squirrels, foxes, deer, and the bear lived. I grew up thinking I'm never going to leave this place. I grew up on the reserve thinking it was the most beautiful place in the world. One of the important parts of day for us. Anishnabek is uh, sunrise. It was really difficult to meet sunrise. Still struggle. That's when the ceremonies began. At sunrise. Yes, I am afraid. The timeless motion of the cool green depth and the dark silence that would follow should I drown here. So strange then that I should meet sunrise at one of those places in my dreams where passage is always difficult and frightening. That stretch of shoreline on the east side of the reserve and the road. With the clouds so low, I thought I'd missed the moment and knew not exactly what I was looking for in sunrise. With the clouds so low, so morning fresh, I wanted to step out onto the water, stretch up my arms and touch those wondrous beings. The waves rolled in singing, pushing pebbles higher onto the shore and took my breath away. Who was I to think I could walk? Sunrise it was then with pink and gold reflections undulating across the waves, mounting and splashing at my feet again and again. And I cast my tobacco prayers onto the waves. Sunlight it was, or sunrise it was, that warmed my shoulders as I left the shore and crossed over the road 
to my sister's house and our seven sleeping daughters. Catching the sun. Morning is always a struggle. Sunrise in Withrow arrives 10 minutes after touching the easternmost reaches of Metro. It must climb rooftops, street by street, hoisting itself into the treetops and then ascending to arch a new day over the city. I caught it one morning, crawling slowly and easily up from between two rooftops and then saw it leap into the golden branches of a tall maple. The day before, it caught me from behind as I hurried to the bleachers. I could see myself bringing up the tail end of the ceremonies, breath heavy on the morning air as I struggled to find sunrise. I could see myself if I was there up north, running red-eyed and sleepy to join the circle already in motion. I must fight and pull and push myself to lift the covers and dress to face the sun. Sometimes my right eye half opens. I sink deeper into the lotus print sheets looking for easy excuses. Why wet my shoes with dew? Why taste a morning pungent with traffic? One of the things I do um, it, with my poetry is I address stereotypes. Uh, and this particular, this particular poem addresses one of those stereotypes. Uh, for example, the most bloodthirsty tribe in North America was either the Iroquois or the Apache. Anyhow, so it says nothing about Anishinaabek. This is called Making You. He is an Iroquois, you can tell by the scalp lock. He is a fine looking brave wearing a breech clout and carrying a war club. You know he is an Iroquois because you have seen a picture of him in your grade five history text. You are at the kitchen table drinking coffee, writing as he looms in through the open door. His intent is to kill you. If you can push your children's green toy box into his path, he will trip over it. The toy box bumps his shins and bounces back. The childish ploy does not work and the Iroquois warrior now towers over you. If you can get a better grip on the toy box and push harder, he will fall. Slowly, bending knees, Keeping an eye on him, you lower yourself behind the green toy box and push again. He steps over it and reaches. You lean back and grapple for some kind of weapon, something from off the table. There is a splattering of blood, of flesh. Vision blurs as your hand sweeps from left to right over the warrior's chest. The warrior is stunned, and the wound now appears clean and does not bleed. He reaches again, motion deliberate. He lunges toward you. It is as if he wants to die, and you thrust your pen into his heart. You stagger under his weight, but do not fall. You cradle the young man, then lower him to the floor and prepare him for death. I, I, 
weeping you weeping inside him. Weeping you ask, why? Why? Why have I killed one of my own? Silent figures, tribal guardians, move about in the shadows of the room. They have been there all the while watching. I, why, why have I killed one of my own? You mourn. The inside frames the outside. The day appears bluer, the grass greener than ever before. From the dim and now crowded kitchen, you look out and see people gathering, coming up the road, some in groups, others alone. They come with condolence and quiet relief to see the dead Indian. They mill about, not speaking, paying homage. The fallen warrior, he is beautiful in death. Your eldest daughter slips in from behind a blanket, a back room, and moves. She seems to be unaware of your anguish and the silent watchers. She scrapes the dead man's flesh from the wall. She plays with it, singing to herself. Through your tears, you think she is being disrespectful. Stop, don't do that. The child continues her play. She delights in shaping, molding, making new images. Her face beams as to her hands. And her hands glow as to the tiny spots on your fingertips that had touched and refused her offering. She raises her hand again. Mommy, see what I can do. Ball of clay, shimmery and alive. When I was a kid growing up on the reserve, I um, I was a Christian. I'm not a Christian anymore. Um, I used to be really angry with uh, Nana Bush. Now, Nana Bush is our culture hero, our trickster, our fool. And that's what we heard growing up. He was our teacher. Every, everybody loved him. We did. We loved his stories. Stories about him. But I was angry with him. I was angry with him for a long while. Until this. Running on the March wind. I have talked to you in twilight before sleep, but never for very long. I have despaired over you, but never for very long. Knowing you to be a trickster, I have been cautious. And yet this morning, I dreamed of you. You were running on the wind, going north in disguise. The others said, look, there goes Santa Claus. That's not Santa Claus, I said. That's Nana Bush. You wore a long serge coat bound with the most colorful sash. But I knew it was you I saw. Your glinting eyes, brown face, and long black hair. But the others didn't seem to care because of the beer, the cards, the table talk. I hurried to the door. Nana Bush, I said, calling. Where are you going? You stopped and huddled in the snow beside a prickly bush. Nana Bush, I said, why don't you visit? You looked back at me. Were you goading me? Then I held you. You cuddly old teddy bear rabbit. I said things to you and tried not to frighten you. Where are you going, Anna Bush? Where are you going? Why, why 
haven't you come this way before? I held you, you cuddly teddy bear rabbit. Then let you go north somewhere. Don't forget to come back. We need you, Nana Push. I dreamed of you passing through my dreams, heading north this morning. Were you goading me? So, Nana Bush, where have you been all these years? Down south, somewhere, in some Peruvian mountain village, maybe? I wondered about where you had gone. Thought maybe you had died rather than just faded away like some dusty old robe. <laughs> I caught you trying to slip through my dream unnoticed. Nana Bush, where have you been all these years? Machu Picchu? The women there, I hear, weave such colorful sashes. In Catherine's house, you were standing in a, pink, in a pink attic where the walls bulge bare and empty of family gone too long. You were standing in a pink attic where the stairwell hangs steep and narrow like old bones in a fragile frame. Into this dream you've come. You have come to this forgotten woman for guidance, maybe for knowledge, for something. And yet you stand here in this dream, daydreaming in her pink attic while she sits downstairs alone, waiting. You make her a cup of tea and feel compelled to give her something, a gift, anything an old greasy washer, something you had picked up along the way. Perhaps in another time, another age, it could have been a coin. She fingers the small gift, and the years of memory unfold between you, sunshine and summer, fields full of flowers and endless youth, days so long ago, now so near. You see age break and fall away like an old worn shell. The old woman becomes youthful again, radiant again, knowing you sit here listening, breaking the spell of senility of useless and lonely years. You know you'll come back to this dream if you can find it. And Catherine, you'll make her tea, you'll sweep her floor, and you listen. You'll come back to listen. It's five o'clock now. Okay, I have actually one more to share and then we will have questions and comments. Okay. Like I said, stereotypes. So this is me saying goodbye to the stereotype actually started because uh, Robert Fulford um, in an article um, decided it was time to say goodbye to the stereotype. Well, <laughs> that cheesed me off. That pissed me off because I thought if anybody's making decisions for us and about us, it should be us. And heck, I'm the one that's going to say goodbye. So just now I want you to remember all those stereotypes about these wild Indians. Goodbye, wild Indian. Goodbye, wild Indian. Goodbye. I know it's time for you to go. It's a good day too 
to go. I want you to know I always rooted for you all those times. All those times when the cavalry and cowboys were kicking your ass and shooting you with their silver bullets. All those times the history books said you were saying you were doomed to die, to vanish from the face of the earth. That meant mom and dad and me too, my whole family, eh? And when you die, each time you died up there on the silver screen and in the paperbacks and in the comics and on the airwaves. Little bits of me died too. <laughs> actually, actually, they just went on reserve waiting for this day. Yeah. I remember dad and mom always went to those dark movie places and rooted for you. Took me too sometimes, and I'd crane my neck when the shooting started because they always covered my eyes and held me tight as the white man's fear and fury whizzed through the air, slamming into our spirits again and again. And I'd look up and see their scarlet tears, and I'd feel their sobs caught hard and silent between heartbeats and dry throats. But they kept their vigil, mom and dad did, time and again, because, because you were still part of us and we were still part of you. And I think they hoped it would all end someday and you'd be free. Yeah, I rooted for you. All those times after I got over the negative part of being Indian, of playing cowboys and Indians and not wanting to be the bad guy, the Indian. It's the truth. It happened. And I'm not ashamed to admit it either. Those were tough times. We didn't know any better. But we do now. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye, wild Indian. I know it's time for you to go. It's a good day, too, to go. Oh, you red devil, you. What a ham you've been. Bloodthirsty, savage fiend. How could you? How could you ravage those white bosoms, those swan-like necks, those frail, pale, voiceless women? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. They made you do it, those white men. What a novel idea. They wanted you, too, to, to do it, those white women. Imagine that. Deepening the intimacy, he captured her mouth. Incredible. Fantastic. She moaned. I cannot help but touch you. Now, what an imagination. What a story. Oh, you handsome breed, you, you raider, you killer, you scalper, you wagon burner, you red deflower of white men's women, you shooter of white man's turkeys, you poacher of white man-made fish, you speaker of red man's wisdom and white man's folly. Golly, you soothsayer, you Smooth sayer, you perpetual fucking conservationist. Oh, they're out to get you now. They're all looking to bury you. <laughs> As if 112 million dead over 500 years wasn't enough already. We've created a monster, they say. Let's bury the noble savage. He's outlived his usefulness. Indians can't. Oh, that's, that's a stereotype, they say. This is the new millennium, and we've got to be politically correct. Besides, they never had any royalty. Can't you just hear those shovels picking at the earth? Bulldozers are rumbling, ready to gouge out great piles of clay. Red clay, red earth man. Say, 
You ever run into that guy, Adam? Yeah. Wouldn't be the first time, neither. Wouldn't be the first time they dug up Indian braves from their graves, eh? Like the Nawash and the city of Owen Sound, a fine Canadian city founded on dead Indians, built of dead Indians. Imagine Indian DNA in the walls of their oldest, most important and prestigious buildings, courthouses, churches, city hall, mansions, tenement buildings and stores. Some brickwork, eh? What technique? Nya. And how about us Indians being trustworthy, reliable, solid as a brick, solid as a red brick? Nya. Hits you, doesn't it? Like a ton. Nya. Nya. What a die tribe. Die tribe, eh? You know, die a tribe. Die tribe. A, like the only good one is the dead one. Yeah, <laughs> feeling bitter, besieged, sat upon. A, goodbye, wild Indian, goodbye. I know it's time for you to go. It's a good day too, to go. On the other hand, maybe they'll just turn you into some stupid cup or something, bona fide. Bone China, bric a brac, kitsch, oh, kitschy Manitou. What'll they do to you next? You're not gonna go, not with them anyway, down the old garden path or is it up? Either way, it's still a rut, one paved with our treaty money. Like how many other Canadian highways? On the other hand, they might just march you off in shackles. Wouldn't be the first time, either. Hey, can't you just see a pair of empty shackles walking down the road all by themselves? Yeah. And you'll just let them think what they've always thought, that what's best for them is best for you, what's best for them is best for us, and that you're following and that we're following you. What you mean, we, white man? <laughs> you know, I think they never think about how they could be like us unless it's for money. Some kind of financial investment down the line or a much higher level of communion with the great spirit than any real Indian could ever achieve. I know, old Indian trick. Just let them think what they want. They always do anyway, that's their problem. And just between you and me, it's been fun, hair-raising, in fact. I'll miss you sometimes. Not much, honest. You must be real tired now. 500 years of whooping it up is one hell of a party. Hey. Goodbye, wild Indian. Rest in peace. I'll always love you. Yeah. Thank you. And now, we're going. Now we'll we'll come for some uh, question and answer. So we'll take some questions from the audience. If anybody has any. Questions, questions or comments. I know we traditionally call this question and answer period, but we'll we'll go with question and comments.
I'm, I'm really optimistic. Um, when I was growing up, and when I was writing, uh, it was really difficult to um, to find other um, other Indigenous writers, uh, First Nations, Inuit, or uh, Métis. And um, in fact, when I went off to university in 1977, I went to because I wanted to do creative writing. And um, it was so difficult at that time to find complete works by native authors or poets. Uh, our work was always anthologized and it stayed anthologized for so many years. And now, I mean, there are all kinds of uh, writers and poets and playwrights and it's just, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. So I have a related question. Um, so I'm, I've got questions here from the virtual audience. Uh, so what would you say to those young Indigenous youth who may be considering storytelling or theatre? Any particular advice or tips? Particular advice or tips? Um, well, I think in terms of writing, um, let, let's deal with that first. Um, I think the important thing is that to always be true with your words. And that's actually something that I have struggled with at times and even come to tears with it just because of the subtlety of words. It could make it a positive thing or it could make it a, a negative thing. And um, that's that's really hard sometimes. Like for example, um, <clears throat> I, uh, the example of um, running on the March wind, um, but the others didn't seem to care because of the beer, the cards and the table talk. Um, first iterations of this poem just uh, omitted the beer part. And it didn't quite, you know, didn't quite, I wasn't really being honest to say that oh, they were drinking and playing cards and just talking stupid at the table. But I came to terms with that. So <clears throat> it's being honest, uh, being honest with words, um, being honest to, honest to yourself. Um, in terms of theater, and I guess for me, theater I, comes with like the, the first uh, storytellers. Um, and, and let me speak it through a storyteller, OK? So there are some things that one needs to remember as a, as a storyteller. One is that you need an audience. You need an audience, so you need to you need to respect the story, respect the the, the people who uh, the story is about. You need to respect your audience, and you need to respect the integrity of the art of storytelling or the art of theater. And to me, that's 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 important. So sometimes, um, I guess, for people who who know me, I I really don't talk a lot unless I'm kind of up center and doing a, doing a presentation or doing something like that. Other than that, I just kind of sink into the background. Okay. So I see some, there's some common threads there between storytelling, writing, and then theater. Yes. Yeah. Okay, are there any other comments or questions from Are you able to repeat that? Okay, so she asked if you could comment on how you work as a naturalist. How I work as a naturalist? Okay, uh, how I work as a naturalist, I uh, take people out on guided hikes. I do guided programs. Um, and 
I introduce them to uh, different plants and trees. And um, we discussed how these trees are you have been used by Anishinaabek and other indigenous peoples for food, for medicine, in ceremony, and for utilitarian everyday uh, uses. Um, and there are certain stories um, attached to uh, different um, different plants and trees. So, for example, if I'm talking about Ninatik, the maple tree, right? Uh, there's a story of Nana Bush and um, maple syrup. Um, so they, they get to hear that story, but they also get to taste a little bit of that because I, I like to entice them and I, and I bring little, little pieces of uh, maple sugar for them to, to taste. So it's that way. And then, of course, there are some of the uh, the other things that are not really stories. Um, for example, there's a certain plant that my mother always asked us to go out and pick. It's called Pearly Everlasting. And um, her reason for, for us picking this plant is that it keeps away evil spirits. So every year, and I do this myself now, I every, every, uh, every August, near the end of summer, I go and I pick handfuls of that and I bring it into my home uh, to keep away bad spirits. Now that sounds really quaint, uh, but um, think of it as a, I don't know, as an antidepressant. It has those qualities. Plants have those qualities. I also um, encourage people, and it, it has happened to me, is I can hear I can hear some plants talk. They say things. Let me give you an example. So um, there was this one trail, and I hadn't. It was closed uh, during during the winter, and the snow had piled up and blown some trees down. These are usually uh, balsam firs. They blow these trees down. And, um, and these trees then fall over other trees and everything gets bent down. So this one time I took it upon myself to go and through the bush and through this trail and shake the snow off and then pull these trees up <laughs> and then take the ones underneath and get the snow, sh shake off the snow and, and, and stand them up. And I could hear, see what she's doing? I mean, they weren't like in English words. It was just like feelings, right? And then I heard a, a feeling of help. So I, I went further along the trail. And I knew right exactly where that, where that feeling, that sound came from. It was this little, this tiny little um, calypso orchid. A branch had fallen over it. And... To me, it was calling for help. So I just lifted that branch out of the way. Uh, there was another time when, when I was doing something that uh, this great big thing, great big bud from a, from a plant slapped me in the forehead. After I had accomplished something, it slapped me in the forehead and it felt like a kiss. So I think, you know, there are ways uh, to communicate uh, with plants, and I don't mind telling people about it. Um, and I also try to encourage people not to refer to them as plants, but refer to them as people. And same with the animals. Refer to the animals as, uh, as who is that, not what is that. Who do you hear? Who made those tracks? Who made those paw prints? Who smelled so nice? So that's how I try to. That's how I work as a as a as a naturalist. Beautiful, thank you. So we are coming close to the end of our time, but I do want to have ask you one more question. I mean, I'll, I'll just look to some of your, my co um, planners here. Could we do the book? We have a book draw for people who are in-house and 
everyone who came in had a ticket. Do you think we could wait to do that until after? And then we could just go with maybe one more question. Okay. All right. So there's one more question here. So when when did you begin storytelling or, or was there was there a moment or an event that prompted you to, to go the path of, of storytelling? Well, I, I guess I have to say I'm the oldest of 10. So I think a lot of my uh, younger years were looking after my sisters and brothers and um, entertaining them, keeping them occupied. Um, and then, you know, listening to the stories uh, my mom and dad and other people would tell. But I do remember one time uh, out in the garden, we were picking, ooh, we were picking, you know, those uh, potato beetles. You have to pick them and drop them into a can of oil. Oh. Anyhow, I was, out, I was out in the garden and there underneath one of the bushes were, were the wings from the dragonfly. And I picked those up and, oh, they were just perfect. So exquisite and I took them into the house and I said look to my sibs I said look see what I found I found a fairy's wings and uh, they came in and they looked at those wings and I, I guess maybe it was probably that point um, to do more <laughs> storytelling <Any moment? laughs> All right, any final comments or questions from the folks here before we uh, move? I think we're good. So, Kevin, if I can call on you to come in, uh, give a, th a thank you and a closing. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, Jamie had to step on, so these are on behalf of Wes. Thank you so much. Oh, you could. Yeah. <coughs> Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Gorgeous. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we are at the end of our time. Uh, please stick around for the book drop. Um, just wanted to extend, well, first of all, I'm Kevin George, uh, Special Projects Coordinator with the Office of Indigenous Initiatives. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone on behalf, uh, all of you for coming, and everyone watching virtually. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Moore for that uh, land acknowledgement and introduction. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you for our interpreters for doing such a tremendous job in making this an accessible event. And uh, also thanks to the theater crew for doing a tremendous job getting everything set up, as well as our, our, our uh, co-hosts, Faculty of Arts, Waterloo Indigenous Student Center, uh, Indigenous Students Association, Office of Indigenous Relations. So to all of you, uh, Chi Miigwech, Neil Nguyen, uh, Marcy, thank you. And also, of course, to Lenore uh, for that masterful telling. Uh, we thank you for uh, your word paintings and for coming and traveling all this distance to this territory from where your sound comes from. So on behalf of Jamie Gletchman, Gletchman Wall.